below. You are redeemed. Redeemed from sickness. Redeemed from death. Redeemed from sin. By the power of the Holy Ghost. It's your season to win. Take your healing. Take your freedom. Take your favor. Give the Lord a shot. Koroto sekele de brina hata egebo zekele de brina kala baboro godo zekele ne mengere de zekele de brina kaloya nama. Praise you, Father. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we rejoice that this evening we have this another opportunity to fellowship in the light of your word. And we rejoice that your word is light unto our paths and is a lamp unto our feet and light unto our paths. And we rejoice that the entrance of your word giveth light and it giveth understanding to the simple. So today as we fellowship in the word, the light of your word shines in our hearts. The eyes of each one's understanding flooded with light. Veils fall off. Clarity comes by the word. Your people built up, equipped, edified. And we decree that whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. We rebuke everything that is contrary to the finished work of Christ. We rebuke everything that contradicts the purpose of God. And we decree that your people are built up, equipped, edified. Jesus is glorified. And we rejoice that by the end of this service tonight, we'll all be the better for it. So we give you praise and glory for answer prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer sees a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our feet together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We well, want to welcome every one of you to this wonderful service tonight by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media community. We're so glad to have all of you in the service today. And I want to welcome all the radio audience in Aquaibom State. What a joy and an honor to serve you the grace of God through the teaching of God's word. Whichever platform you're connected to this service by, whether Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, you know you, FM, Inspiration, FM or Heritage FM, I'd like you to get ready and invite a friend, a loved one, a family member, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. And I want to ask all of you on social media, family and friends, do me the favor you've always done as co-laborers with me. Let's get this word to the ends of the earth. Help me share the video on your page. Share with all the groups on your page. Of course, create watch parties, tag some people, put them on monogram, telegram, and WhatsApp groups. Let's flood the earth with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. All our house churches, what a joy to see every one of you tonight. It's exciting to know that we're going to study the word and grow in the knowledge of Christ. All our campuses around the world, we welcome every one of you to the service, guys. You get ready. It's going to be exciting as we continue our study on how and why we give i'd like you to grab your pen your notebook and your bible and you can be seated with your sweet smart self as we get into the word tonight praise god mm -mm -mm. 
All right, this is a continuation of what we started sharing on Sunday morning on how and why we give. We are looking at the New Testament spirit of generosity. The New Testament spirit of generosity. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. A lack of understanding of the subject or a lack of understanding of this particular subject has, has grave implications to the believer. It cannot be left to speculations or assumptions. The truth is, if one's interpretation of the Bible is wrong, his worship cannot be right. Because worship is predicated on proper interpretation of the scriptures. Of course, like we said on Sunday, a golden rule in Bible interpretation is scriptures can never mean today what they never meant when they were first written. That is to say, no one is given any right to interpret scriptures in his own way. You must arrive at the same interpretation of the truth. The reason for dutiful and diligent study of the scriptures cannot be overemphasized. You remember on Sunday we said it, that when the scriptures are not rightly divided, you cannot get the truth out of a lie. That any scriptural teaching that is not premised on the rightly dividing of scripture cannot be the truth. It means somebody is preaching a lie to you because scriptures must be rightly divided. Now the word study, study to show yourself approved, the word study is the Greek word spoudazo, S-P-O-U-D-A-Z-O, spoudazo. It implies to be eager. In other words, be diligent to make every effort. Be diligent to make every effort. Brother Paul used that same word in the same epistle. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. The word study. The word spudazo. Diligence. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 21. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 21. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeted thee, and Pudens and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Same word for spudazo. It means make every effort. That means one has a duty, a responsibility to make every effort in proper interpretation of the scriptures. He used another word in his letter to Titus. Look at Titus chapter 3 verse number 12. Titus chapter 3 verse number 12. When I shall send Artemis unto the Articus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Be diligent to come to me. Be diligent. So that word, diligence, is the word study, the word spudazo. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now the word doctrine is the word for teaching, which means teaching will reprove, teaching will correct, then instruct in righteousness. In other words, the teacher will be educating and training. He will be educating and training. It is not good enough to bring out knowledge. It must involve education. And this education cannot come by relying only on one text of scripture. It cannot come on relying only on one text of scripture. Let's examine Brother Paul's description of the facts of the gospel. The facts of the gospel. When we say the gospel, what are the facts that constitute the gospel? Because many people do not know what the gospel is. Some people think, well, the gospel is any good news. 
So if you are giving me good news about business, it is the gospel. If you are giving me good news about success in, in career, it is good news. And the reason is because they do not know the facts of the gospel. The gospel is a specific message. A specific message like we will see together. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse number 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Next verse. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Those are the facts of the gospel. Brother Paul focused on the resurrection as paramount in the presentation of the gospel of Christ. Look at what he will say in the same context. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Our preaching is vain, your faith is vain, if Christ be not risen. Look at verse 17 of the same context. Verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. You are yet in your sins. So, the gospel of Christ is definite in its presentation of the facts of Jesus' resurrection. It is definite in his presentation of the facts of Jesus' resurrection. So the message of Jesus is unmistakable. The message of Jesus is unmistakable and unambiguous. It's unmistakable and unambiguous in his facts. In his facts. And as we will see, it has nothing to do with a promise. Or a guarantee of material possession. The message of Christ is unmistakable and unambiguous in its facts. And such, the gospel of Christ has nothing to do with a promise, guarantee of material possession. The gospel of Christ does not guarantee anybody a promise of material possession. We will see that in details. We will see believers who are either rich or poor in material possession. And the fact that no believer has exemptions from industry. Every believer is expected to be engaged in industry as a means of financial prosperity. Industry, investments, career pursuit, you know, uh, creativity, innovations. All of those are the mediums through which material prosperity is made available. Those were strong apostolic warnings in scripture. And they are concerning the preaching of another gospel. The preaching of another gospel. Brother Paul and all the apostles gave strong warning on the preaching of another gospel. Let's hear brother Paul on another gospel. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. And I'm going to read to verse 9. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him. That called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now look at verse 6 again so that we can now interpret this. Verse 6. Galatians 1 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed. The word removed. The word removed was translated from the Greek word metatithemai. I can spell for those of you making notes. M E T A meta T T I meta T T I T 
Temai. T-H-E-M-I. I go over it again. M-E-T-A-T-I-T-H-E-M-I. Metatithemai. It implies to change sides. To pervert. It is used five times in the New Testament text of the Bible. The word to pervert. Now that same word, that same word removed or the, the same word to pervert is the same word used in Jude chapter 1 verse 4. Where he used the word turning. Jude chapter 1 verse 4. <clears throat> For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They are turning the grace of God. The word to turn is the same word for pervert. It's the same word for removed. Now, then there's another word there, the word another. You have been removed from the gospel of Christ unto another. The word another is translated from the Greek word heteros. Heteros. H-E-T-E-R-O-S. Heteros. H-E-T-E-R-O-S. It implies different or altered or strange. Different or altered or strange. Then there's another, another there in verse 7. Give me Galatians chapter 1 verse number 7. Galatians chapter 1 verse 7. Which is not another. But there be some. There be some that trouble you. And will pervert the gospel of Christ. Which is not another. That word another there. Was translated from the Greek word alos. A-L-L-O-S. Alos. It implies another of the same sort. Another of the same sort allows now bringing all of this into context galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 9 will brother paul was saying that the strange gospel was not another of the same sort rather the strange gospel was a different sort of that which they had received a different sort another gospel all right another gospel it's a different sort or a strange gospel that is different from what they had received then brother paul says but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of christ the word trouble was translated from the greek word taras taraso taraso t-a-r-a-s-s-o taraso it implies to steer or agitate. To steer or agitate. It is used 17 times for information. Information that you receive by sight or by hearing. Information that you receive by sight or by hearing. That causes a steering or agitation. That agitates you. That gives you an unsettlement or takes away from you rest. It makes you unrest. It gives you unrest. It makes you unsettled in your persuasion about Christ. All right. So it, it is. It is. It is trouble, terrasso, to agitate or to steer. That word is used in Matthew two verse three. You can write down for further study. Matthew chapter two verse three. When Herod heard that Jesus was born, he was troubled. Troubled. Agitated. Matthew, Matthew 14, 26. Matthew 14, 26. When the disciples saw Jesus in the sea and were troubled. Mark chapter 6, verse 50. Mark chapter 6, verse 50. Then Acts chapter 15, verse 24. Trouble you with words. Acts 15, 24. To trouble you with words. Then Acts chapter 17 verse 8. Acts chapter 17 verse 8. Alright, so I go over it again. Matthew 2 verse 3. Matthew 14 26. Mark 6 50. Acts 15 24. Acts 17 8. The word 
trouble. The word to agitate, to stir up, to give you an unsettlement, to tamper with your conviction. Look at that Galatians chapter 1 verse 7 again. Galatians chapter 1 verse number 7. Which is not another, but there be some which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. They trouble you and will pervert. The word pervert was translated from the Greek word metrastrefo. Metrastrefo. For those of you making notes, the word pervert in the Greek is M-E M-E T-R-A T-R-A S-T-R E-P-H-O Metrastrefo It implies to transmute or corrupt to transmute or to corrupt to transmute or to corrupt it, it implies the word pervert to corrupt or to transmute look at verse 8 of Galatians 1 Galatians 1 8 but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be a cause let him be a cause the word a cause is translated from the Greek word anatema 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 a-n-a-t-h-e-m-a -A -E it implies to ban or to excommunicate or separate from anatema to ban to excommunicate or to separate from so this emphasizes the instructional warning against another gospel that which perverts the facts of the gospel another gospel is that which perverts the facts of the gospel please pay attention look at the book of second corinthians chapter 11 verse 4 second corinthians chapter 11 verse number 4 for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So there is another spirit, there is another Jesus, there is another gospel. Please pay attention. Now he says, if he that cometh preacheth, the word preacher was translated from the Greek word keruso. K-E-R-U-S-S-O. Keruso. It means to announce or publish. To announce or publish. Then observe the use of the word another. Another Jesus. Another spirit. Another gospel. The word another in this context, he used that word alos. Alos for Jesus. Which implies to preach the same Jesus in a different way. To preach the same Jesus in a different way. He used the word heteros. H-E-T-E-R-O-S. Heteros. For the spirit. And also for the gospel. So another Jesus is same Jesus in a different way. Then he uses heteros for the spirit and the gospel. Which implies another of a different sort another of a different sort another gospel which means a different sort now observe the next instruction you might well bear with him you might well bear with him that phrase is from a compound word anakoma anakomai anakomai a-n-e-c-h-o M A I. I repeat, A N E C H O M A I. Anakomai. It implies to hold oneself up against. To bear with him means to hold yourself in resistance against this gospel. Another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. 
It implies that there must be a stern opposition against the preaching and teaching and the reception of another gospel. A strong resistance, a strong opposition against the preaching and teaching and reception of another gospel. The adjectives that qualify the word faith. Let's look at the adjectives that qualifies the word faith. The word faith. In the book of Acts, look at Acts chapter 3 verse 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 verse number 16. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Has given to him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Take note of two things in that verse. Number one, faith in his name. Faith, so it is faith in his name. Number two, faith which is by him. Faith in his name. Faith which is by him. Then look at Acts 24, 24. Acts chapter 24, verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Did you observe that? Faith in Christ. So faith is in his name. Faith which is by him. The faith in Christ. Look at Acts 26, 18. Acts chapter 26 verse number 18. To open their eyes and to turn them, to turn them from darkness to light. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Take note of that. By faith that is in me. Did you observe? So we have faith in his name. We have faith which is by him. We have the faith in Christ. We have faith that is in me. Let's look at the epistles and see how faith is used. Romans chapter 3 verse 3. Romans chapter 3 verse number 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? The faith of God. The faith of God. Look at 22 and 25 of Romans 3. Romans chapter 3, 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 25. Whom God has set forth, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. Look at Romans, I mean Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Galatians chapter 2 verse number 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. By the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ. By the faith of Jesus Christ. By the faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we have faith of Jesus Christ. Then we have faith in Christ. Alright. Now look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 22. 
Galatians 3 22 but the scripture has concluded all on the scene that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe faith of Jesus Christ look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me faith of the Son of God all right so we've seen the faith of Jesus Christ faith in Christ Jesus faith of the Son of God faith of God Ephesians 1 15 Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 lots of scriptures good for your health wherefore I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus of your faith in the Lord Jesus faith in the Lord Jesus Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him by the faith of him all right the faith of him philippians 1 27 philippians chapter 1 verse 27 only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of christ that whether i come and see you or else be absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Faith of the gospel. Faith of the gospel. Philippians 3 verse 9. Philippians chapter 3 verse number 9. And be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, the faith of Christ. Look at Colossians 1 verse 4. Colossians chapter 1 verse number 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, faith in Christ Jesus. So we have seen faith in his name, Faith which is by him, the faith in Christ, faith that is in me. We have seen faith of Jesus Christ, faith in Christ Jesus, faith in the Lord Jesus, the faith of him, the faith of the gospel, the faith of God, the faith of Christ, faith in Christ Jesus. Now observe the adjectives and the frequency of the phrases. Faith in Christ and faith in the gospel. This shows that the word faith in the book of Acts and the word faith in the epistles majorly define faith in the resurrection of Jesus. Faith in the book of Acts and faith in the epistles majorly define faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the next question I want to answer is, what is received upon faith in Christ? When a man believes in the resurrection, when a man hears the gospel and believes the gospel, what does he receive at the point of believing? It is important to examine what a man receives when he has faith in Christ. Because the scriptures are explicit on the exact things that a man receives. The scriptures are very explicit and specific on what a man receives when he receives the gospel and believes in Christ Jesus. So the first thing a man receives is eternal life. The moment you believe the gospel, you believe in Jesus, you receive eternal life. John chapter 6 verse 47. John chapter 6 verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Hath everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 15. John chapter 3 verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have 
eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So at the point of believing, a man receives eternal life. Look at John 3, 36. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. John 20, 31. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. At the point of believing, you receive the life of God, which is eternal life. So, everlasting life was only available when Jesus rose from the dead. So, when a man has faith in Christ, or when a man exercises faith in the gospel of Christ, he has everlasting life. Number two, a man receives sonship when he believes the gospel. He receives sonship. John chapter 1 verse 12. John chapter 1 verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name sonship galatians 3 26 galatians chapter 3 verse 26 for you are all the children of god how by faith in christ jesus so when you exercise faith in christ jesus you become a child of god you become a child of god number three when you believe in Christ or believe in the gospel, you receive remission and forgiveness of sins. You receive remission or forgiveness of sins. And you remember on Sunday we established that forgiveness of sin is not an answer to prayer. It's a gift of God's grace. So at the point of believing the gospel, you receive remission and the forgiveness of sins. Look at Acts chapter 10 verse 43. Acts chapter 10 verse 43. <clears throat> to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Shall receive remission of sins. Whosoever believes. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. How? According to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace. You can read Colossians 1.14 at home. And Acts 26.18. Colossians 1.14. And Acts 26.18. It all buttresses the fact that once you believe the gospel, you receive remission and forgiveness of sins. So forgiveness of sin is an inheritance among them that are sanctified. How? By faith that is in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness of sins is an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in Christ. The fourth thing you receive is justification and righteousness. The moment you believe the gospel, you receive justification and righteousness. Acts 13.39 Acts 13.39 And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So when you believe you are justified from all things. Hallelujah. From which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation 
to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith so you receive justification and righteousness so the righteousness of God is in the gospel of Christ the righteousness of God is not in conduct it's not in human efforts the righteousness of God is in the gospel of Christ. The righteousness of God is for all that believe the gospel. Take note of it. The righteousness of God is in the gospel of Christ. Number two, the righteousness of God is for all that believe the gospel. The next thing you receive when you believe the gospel, which is number five, is the spirit of God. When you believe the gospel, you receive the spirit of God. Look at the book of John 7.39. John chapter 7 verse number 39. <clears throat> but this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Then look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 14. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 14. 14, 3, 14. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 14. Mm -mm -mm. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. So when you believe, you receive the promised spirit. When you receive, when you believe, you receive the promised spirit. So when a man believes the gospel, he is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So faith in Christ is forgiveness of sins. Faith in Christ is eternal life faith in christ is justification faith in christ is the indwelling of the spirit and it means that the believer is a son there's no scripture we have read that says faith in christ is material wealth there's no scripture that says faith in christ guarantees financial prosperity there's no such scripture you know, somebody was trying to argue blindly because, I call it blind because you don't argue with somebody when you yourself don't even know what you're talking about. After I finished preaching on Sunday, and he said, but, but the Bible guarantees believers material wealth. I said, well, he said, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. I told him, okay, I can quote it for you. You shall remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to make wealth, that he may establish the covenant which is unto your father's. And I asked him, which fathers was he talking about? I asked him, is your physical father among the fathers? He said, no. Was your father born when that was said? He said, no. So that means he's not talking about something that you're thinking. The covenant he swore to their fathers, their fathers, Abraham, that the children of Abraham will be in slavery for 400 years. And then he will bring them out with great substance. So them coming out of Egypt... On their way to Canaan, the way God prospered them in Egypt by industry and hard work. Because in Egypt, they were slaves. They worked hard. So that money they came out of Egypt was with was their pay for their hard work. It was not free money. It was their pay for their hard work. Then he now told them on their way in Deuteronomy to Canaan, you shall remember that when you were in Egypt, it was the Lord your God that gave you favor. So that the labor you labored was not wasted. Your tax masters paid you before you left. That's what he's talking about. It's not saying that God will give you power to multiply money just by sowing seed. No, the children of Israel didn't sow seed. They were working hard as laborers under tax masters. 
And then when they were living, God gave them favor for their tax masters to pay them some of their monies. So that they left Egypt not poor, they left Egypt with money. But even observe, on their way to the promised land, they were hungry, nowhere to buy food. They're in the bush with all the money, yet they could not buy food. They are thirsty, they could not buy water. They, their clothes were growing old, they could not buy new clothes, but they had money. A place, a time comes when money is useless. Money cannot do everything. Now they have money, but they are hungry. They have money, but they are thirsty. They have money, they cannot buy clothes. They have money, they cannot change shoes. So what happens again? God now gives them manna through the ministry of Moses, water from the rock, all right, so they can drink without money. So they ate without money. They drank without money. Then God touched their clothes. As they grew, their clothes grew and never went old. He touched their shoes. As their legs were growing, the shoes were growing. You shall remember that it is the Lord thy God that giveth thee power to make wealth. What wealth? The basic necessities. Food to eat, water to drink, clothes to wear, shoes to wear. That's why I say having food and raiment, basic necessities. Let us deal with the content. Food and clothes. So God still miraculously helped them. But remember, the miracles didn't follow them to Canaan. When they entered Canaan, they had to till the ground in order for them to have food. So even miracles are not meant for sustenance. Miracles are just interventions of God at one point or the other to assist you. But the proper way of living is industry, commerce, and productivity. Now, so when he was talking about that, he was not saying that in Christ Jesus, you will have money miracles. No, that's not what he was talking about. He was just telling the children of Israel to remember the Lord their God. Because they were on their way to Canaan and Moses was not going to go with them. So he was telling them, don't forget how God helped you so that you can continue to walk in the ways of God. So it wasn't saying that there is a special world for covenant children of God. There's no such thing. Anybody teaching you that is deceiving you. There's no such thing. Scriptures must be rightly divided so we don't end up telling people lies because when scriptures are not rightly divided, you'll be lying against the scriptures. All right? Now, let's get back to what we're dealing with here <clears throat> because we've been looking at the things that when you believe the gospel, you get. When you believe the gospel, you have faith in Christ, you receive forgiveness of sins, you receive eternal life, you receive justification, you receive the indwelling of the spirit that now makes you a son of God. That is what faith in Christ and the gospel of Christ guarantees. That is what faith in Christ and the gospel of Christ guarantees. Remember on Sunday, we examine the man who gave money for power. Who was sowing a seed for, to tap into grace. Who was sowing a seed in exchange for a breakthrough. Who gave something to get something. When you give to get, it's no more generosity. It is now a transaction. It means you are buying something. You are buying God's favor. You are buying God's anointing. You are buying God's grace. And Peter told him, Go and perish with your money. You cannot buy the gift of God. Why? The gift of God is what nobody qualifies for. You can't buy the grace of God. You cannot buy the favor of God. You can't even buy divine health. So that's why when they went to preach, he told them, freely you have received, freely give. Everything that comes from God is free. Everything that comes from God is free. Romans 8 32. He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? If it is from Jesus, the risen Lord, it will be free. But if you have to pay for it, it's another Jesus. If you have to sow a seed to get it, it's another Jesus. If you have to sow a seed, to get that breakthrough is another gospel. It's not the gospel of Christ. If it is from Jesus who died and rose, how shall he not with him also 
freely give us all things. Now, that should help. Let me move into something. The moment I am given to get, I become covetous. I am not giving to get. I am giving so that someone's need can be met. That is kingdom giving. The only need on my mind when giving is the need of the person who will benefit from my giving. The need of the person who will benefit from my giving. That's why many folks use who used to pay tithe, first fruit and all of that, when they discover that if they don't pay their tithe, nothing will go wrong, they stop because they never gave to God. They were giving to their greed and their covetousness. Because if you're giving to God, even if you discover there's no benefit, you won't stop giving because why you were giving in the first place was not just for the benefit. It was to God himself. But when you are giving for benefit and you discover there's no benefit, you won't give again. Somebody says, so Dr. Damina, that means there's no motivation to give. I said, the only motivation to give is that you love Christ. You love Christ and you love the brethren. Finish. And if you don't love Christ, you don't love the brethren. Yet, yes, then it is true. There's no motivation to give. Because the only motivation is that you love Christ. You appreciate what Christ has done for you. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, then there's no motivation to give. And I can quickly submit to you, that means you're not born again. That means you're not born again. Because if you're born again, the love of God in your heart will constrain you to meet the needs of brethren. Alright? So, the moment, the moment they hear that it is no more, you know, there's no more cause for not tithing. They just close their hands, fold their arms. And you know, from Sunday, this coming Sunday, from this coming Sunday, uh, from this coming Sunday to the upper Sunday, every day from that Sunday, first, second service to the upper Sunday, I'm going to be examining the doctrine of tithe and tithing. The doctrine of tithe and tithing. And we will do exegesis on it from Sunday to Sunday, every day. It's going to be explosive. And we will examine first fruit and firstborn offerings. We'll look at all of that in the light of scripture so that you have sound understanding so that you will do what you need to do for the kingdom with a clear conscience and with an understanding. I'm sure that's going to help a lot. Now, if you observe very carefully, we want to quickly look at examples of giving. Examples of giving. But just before we look at the examples of giving in scripture, how did God give? God gave freely. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us freely. He gave Christ to us free of charge. Look at Romans 8 32. Romans chapter 8 verse number 32. <clears throat> He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Anything that comes from Jesus, the risen Lord, is freely given. There is nothing you pay for whatever comes from Jesus. So let's look at examples of giving. Luke chapter 8 verse 2 to 3. Luke chapter 8 verse 2 to 3 uh -uh. and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities may recall Magdalene out of whom went seven devils verse 2 I mean verse 3 and Joanna the wife of Chusa Herod steward and Susanna and many others which ministered unto him of their substance the women gave to Jesus they were not given to get anything in return. They ministered to him of their substance. They were not expecting to get back. They gave. Why? Because their lives have been affected by Jesus. He cast out devils from them. They've experienced the grace of God. In response to that grace, they ministered to him of their substance. All right? Now, Look at Mark chapter 12 verse 41. Mark chapter 12 verse 41. 
And Jesus sat over against the treasury and behold, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. Next verse. 42. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. Next verse. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow had cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. Than all they which have cast into the treasury. 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Even all her living. So this woman, you know, the Bible says she had a little. And she gave, expecting nothing. And that's what we are teaching here. You give what you have. You give what you have and be happy. You don't give and be saying, well, I don't know if that God accepts it or not. No. If a man gives according to what he has, it is acceptable. You give what you have and be happy. As long as what you gave sincerely is your best, you'll be happy. There's no point for you to be feeling like, oh, I don't know. No. You are already accepted in the beloved. Look at Matthew 26 verse 7. A woman poured on Jesus what today is called an alabaster box. Matthew 26 verse number 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. So a woman poured that box on Jesus. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, To what purpose is this waste? They called it waste. If Jesus had taught them to give and get back, they wouldn't have called it waste. The reason why they called it waste is because they know that nothing is going to come back. So the apostles knew that in giving, we only give, expecting nothing in return. That's why they called that alabaster box waste. Now, that means when you give, you are letting it go. Give and let it go. You are not waiting for something to come back. Transaction is different from giving. When you are giving, you are not investing. You are giving and letting go. And then somebody says, so why then do we give? Since nothing is coming in return, there's nothing to expect. Why then do we give? Number one, we give to break the hold of material over us. We give to break the hold of material stuff over us. To break the hold of covetousness. And break the hold of greed over our lives. When we give, we demonstrate that greed and covetousness has no control over us. We break the hold of greed and covetousness over our lives so giving therefore is walking in the spirit giving is walking in the spirit giving is not a transaction it's a walk in the spirit you need to check your motives from time to time why do you give why do you help people somebody's in need you give to them why are you giving why are you helping are you expecting something in return? Because people often help people who can help them tomorrow. And that is not giving. That is a transaction. Jesus said, how are you different from the unbelievers? So when people don't say thank you, you don't give them again. But when you don't tell God thank you, he still gives you. Every day you wake up, the sun shines whether you say thank you or not. All the time. So when people don't say thank you, many people won't give again. But God is not like that. Some people even preach it. If you don't give thanks, your thank will never be full. That's not true. That's not my God. That's a, transact that's a transactory gospel. That's not the gospel of Christ. You know, Acts chapter 2 verse 44 to 45. Look at it. Acts 2 44 to 45. Praise God. Are we getting blessed tonight? 
Acts 2, 44, 45. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Next verse. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. As every man had need. They sold their possessions. And they gave as every man had need. Look at Acts 4, 32 and 35. Acts chapter 4, 32 and 35. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed were his own, but they had all things come on. And laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Nobody was given to meet their own needs. They were given to meet the needs of others. In Acts chapter 11 verse 29, there was a famine, there was drought. Acts eleven twenty nine. look at what happened. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. They were not sending expecting some breakthrough. They were sending to help brethren who were in need. Give me the next verse. The next verse. Which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. There was recession in Jerusalem and the brethren sent relief materials. They didn't give to expect something. Name your seed. Claim it and name it, name it and claim it. When believers have need, we give to meet the need of believers. Case closed. We don't give waiting for how God, God is not MMM. God is not a Ponzi schemer. No. Brother Paul emphatically, openly said, he that wants to eat must walk. He that does not walk should not eat. That's apostolic industry. Give yourself to work hard. Labor. In all labor, there is profit. Look at 1 John chapter 3 verse 17. 1 John 3 17. But whoso had this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shut it up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He shut it up the bowels of compassion. You know why he will shut up the bowels? Because nothing will come back. There's no returns. You give to meet a need. And we keep giving and giving until the need is met. That's giving in the kingdom. That's giving in the kingdom of God. Are we still in the building here? Yeah. That's what Jesus meant by faith without I mean that's what James meant. By faith without works is dead. What works? Love. Giving. To meet the need of brethren who are in need. And, and that's why James said, if your brother is in need. And he says, brother, I am in need. And you tell him, close your eye, let us pray. When you have what it takes to meet the need. He said, my brother, show me your faith without your works. And I show you my faith with my works. For faith without works is dead, inoperative. I can't be praying for you to have a miracle of 3,000. When I can give you 5,000. So instead of prayer, what do I do? I give you. And that settles the prayer. That settles the prayer. You know, a lady was, used to come to this church years back. <laughs> and then every time the service is over, she will come to the pulpit and ask me to pray for her waist. <laughs> I prayed for this waist until I was becoming intimidated. You know, and when I prayed, she would say, it's fine. The next day, she's back with the waist. So after a while, I wanted to pray for her, so I spoke in tongues and I asked the Holy Ghost for understanding. Then I looked at her and said, Sister, what kind of bed do you sleep on? She laughed. She said, Why are you asking? Why are you asking? I said, The Spirit of God said I should ask you. What kind of bed do you sleep on? on, on? She said, uh, Anyway, it's true. Uh, the bed is a six spring bed, and the spring in the middle is no more. So when I lie down, my waist enters the spring place. And when I wake up, I have pains. I say, you should have told me long ago and saved me these endless prayers. How much is a bed? At that time, a bed was 250 naira. I took 
300. I told her, go and buy. And let us be free. Guess what? She never came for prayer. Her prayer was answered by 250 naira. 300 naira took care of her worries. I could have been praying till Jesus comes. So when he's talking about faith without works, he's talking about meeting the needs of brethren. That once you are in faith, that faith will produce works. Works will be your love for the brethren and the ability to meet the needs of brethren. Am I communicating at all? Am I communicating at all? Because the fruit of faith is love. The fruit of faith is love. First John chapter 3 verse 16. First John chapter 3 verse number 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he had laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So every man gave as he had ability. Nobody gave expecting anything in return. We are not in a transaction. Those who respond to such are greedy. If the only time you give is when you are promised a return, you are a greedy believer. If you want more money, go and walk. Meet societal needs. What makes people prosper is the work of their hands. Whether honest or dishonest. That is how people prosper in the world. That is why we don't celebrate the rich. Because we don't know how they got it. So we don't celebrate the rich. We just encourage people to give as they have ability. Some people are going for deliverance to get a job. In the company of a man that is not born again. You didn't get that. You're going for deliverance to get a job in the company of a man that is not born again. Does it make sense? You are going for special deliverance. And the man doing you deliverance is very collecting consultation fee, co collecting prayer fee. You are busy paying money to get a job from an unbeliever who doesn't know Jesus. A lot of people have been, their brains are washed in church. They are not thinking straight. And they keep telling you, you need deliverance. You need deliverance before you apply for the job. Who is going to give you the job? An unbeliever who is not delivered. But you have to be delivered. To get an unbeliever is not delivered to give you a job. It does not make sense at all. Are we still in the building? Some people change their names to get a job. <laughs> in the company of a man whose name is more meaningless than theirs. Your name was what? Your name was Stone. 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 So you now change your name from Stone to Flower. Stone to flower, okay, to go and get a job in the company of Satan. The owner of the company's name is Satan. Yet you have to change your name to get a job in the company of Satan. Does it make sense? It makes no sense. It's just, it's just, it's just lack of thoroughness, lack of properness in Bible teaching. People are not paying attention to details. Romans chapter 12 verse 8 says, give with sincerity. Give with sincerity. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 2 says, give with sincerity and generosity. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2. If you reduce what you are giving because something is not coming back to you, you are still a greedy and covetous person. If when you used to give to get something, you gave more, that now that you are giving because nothing is coming, you reduce it. You are still greedy and covetous. Because if you are sincere in your giving, whether something is coming or not, you will still give exactly what you give. So greed and covetousness is the problem with a lot of givings in the church. Are we still in the building? Is a lot of problem with a lot of givings in the church. We give more. We give much more. We give until the need is met. Those who give to meet their needs. Look at the church. That's the first people we give to meet their needs. We give to the church to meet the need of the church. 1 Corinthians 16, 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 1. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order, order, to the churches of Galatia, even so, 
do ye next verse upon the first day of the week let every one of you lay by him in store as had prospered that there be no gatherings when I come that God there is not in the original as he hath prospered that there be no gatherings when I come so I must meet the need of the saints how do I need the meet need? How do I meet the need of the saints when I make money available to the church so that radio broadcast is going on? Through radio, the saints are being fed. Through television, Kingdom Life Network, the saints are being fed. Through social media, the need of the saints are being met. When we make money available for the church to reach out. For the church to minister through different platforms, we are meeting the needs of the saints. So whatever is done within the confines of this church is done to meet the needs of the saints. And he says you should lay it aside. As you are making money, you lay aside a portion to meet the need of the saints. You can't have a Mercedes-Benz living. And be given a cada level offering. You can't have a Mercedes Benz living and be given a cada kekena pep. What is it called? Kekena pep. What is the international name? Tricycle or rickshaw for those in, in India. Rickshaw or tricycle. You can't be given a tricycle offering when you are having a Mercedes Benz lifestyle. It means you are greedy. It means you are covetous and it means you have not understood what it means to be in Christ. Now the first level of giving. We give to meet the needs of saints. Number two, you give to your pastor. You give to your pastor. Galatians chapter 6 verse 6. Galatians chapter 6 verse number 6. <clears throat> Let him that is taught in the world communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. In all good things. Not the one that the preacher finished preaching. All of you will say, stretch your hands towards the man of God. For virtue has left him. Let's pray for God to refill him. Stop that nonsense. You pray for yourself. Don't pray for me. Don't, the Bible didn't say pray for me when I preach. It said give to me. That your prayer will, re will replenish me. Don't worry. Just <laughs> that your giving will replenish me. He said let him that is taught communicate with his teacher in all good things. That's what we call the honor offering. Every time you give an honor offering, that offering comes to me. It comes to me, your teacher. It is now left for me, your teacher, to decide whether to give it back to the work of God or to use it. Oh, of course, in most cases, in fact, in all cases in this church, I give it back to the church. But make sure you still give to me first. I receive it as mine and I give it back to the work of God. Let him that is taught communicate with his teacher in how many good things all so every area of your life when there's increase when good things come to you you must also ensure that i your teacher am a partaker of every area of your life where good things come you increase in money you make sure i have my portion as you're setting aside for the saints you are setting aside for your teacher as you are enjoying the chicken make sure you have my own chicken somewhere to send across why in all good things. Let him communicate with his teacher in all good things. So every area where good things are happening to you, I must be a partaker in that area. Why? Because my teaching is helping to make your life better. I am also laboring over you. Let him communicate with his teacher in all good things. Are we still in the building? First Timothy chapter 5 verse 17. Uh, you know, also says first timothy 5 17 5 17 let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double salary double offering the word honor there means money double offering especially they who labor in the word and doctrine especially they who labor in the word and doctrine so as good things are happening to you, you need to communicate with me and honor my labor over you. If it's clear, can I have a good amen? amen. Number three, you give to the poor. You give to the poor. Galatians chapter 2 verse 10. Galatians chapter 2 verse number 10. 
Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Remember the poor. Remember the poor. Romans 15, 26. Romans 15, 26. Romans 15, 26. For it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. 27. It had pleased them verily and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty also is also to minister unto them in carnal things. 28. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So we set aside monies to also help the poor. To also help the poor. To also help the poor. Now, remember, number four, you give to widows. But in giving to widows, he said we give to widows that are above 60. Widows that are above 60. They are the widows the Bible recommends we give to. And they are called widows indeed. And there is a qualification for even those widows. They must have received strangers. They must have raised up children. And they must have given themselves to prayer day and night. Those are the class of widows we give to. Brother Paul said, encourage the younger widows to be married. They should go and get remarried. If you're a young woman and you're a widow, clean up yourself, package yourself quickly and believe God for a man and position yourself where a man will marry you. Very important. Very, very important. Alright, now, Paul wrote that we must not support those that are lazy. If a brother is lazy and is poor, we don't support them. Because supporting a lazy brother is encouraging a culture of laziness. We must not suppose, support brethren that are lazy. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse number 7. 2 Thessalonians 3 7. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Next verse. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travel night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Next verse. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Next verse. For even when we are with you, this we commanded you, that if any will not walk, neither should he eat. Next verse. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, walking not at all, but are busy bodies. Next verse. Now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that, we, that with quietness they walk, and eat their own bread. Next verse. But ye brethren, be not weary in well doing. Verse 14. And if any obey not our word by this epistle and give himself to laziness, not that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. We do not support brethren that are lazy. If somebody is lazy, don't give him your money. Tell him to go and get a job. And if you don't get the job of your choice, whatever your hand finds to do, do it. Giving to someone who is lazy is not scriptural at all. It's against the teaching of the scriptures. You must make sure the person is not a busybody. If someone who is not lazy is in need, we know he is not lazy. He has a prescribed job that we all know. It's just a discretion or misjudgment that got him in trouble. We can rally around and help him. But not a lazy person. When I give, I give because I am not covetous. I give because I am not greedy. I give because I am generous. I give because I am walking in the spirit. 
Can I give without love? Yes. First Corinthians 13 verse 3. You can give without love. You may have other motives. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be born and have not charity, it profited me nothing. It profited me nothing. So I can give without charity. I can give without the motive of love. I can even give my body to be born to score a point. And he says it profits me nothing. I must give without condition and I must give generously. Now back to the scripture where we started this series from. Acts 8, 19 and 20. Acts chapter 8 verse 19 and 20. Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Next verse. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast taught that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Look at the next verse, 21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. So it's not give to get. It is give so others can get. When I give to get, my heart is not right. When I give for the purpose of getting, my heart is not right. Jesus entered the temple in Mark 11 and John 2 and drove out people that were buying and selling. Buying and selling. He drove them out of the house and he says, it is written, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves, giving to get. So, to tap. Give for God to multiply. It's merchandise. Jesus calls it robbery. He, has, he called that a den of robbers. Any church where that is happening, Jesus calls it a den of robbers. We do not give to get. We give because we love God. He drove out money changers. Anywhere you find people giving to get is a house of merchandise. Anywhere. Jesus alone will be taught in all nations. In the name of Jesus. All of Africa, the light of God's word is shining. Jesus and Jesus alone will be preached. Greed, covetousness, mammon are exposed by the Holy Ghost. That version of the gospel of merchandise, greed, materialism that version of the gospel ends in africa and the rest of the world in jesus name it ends making people seek jesus for the wrong reasons that gospel makes people seek jesus for the wrong reason it makes people see jesus as a means to an end let me use jesus to get a car let me use jesus to marry let me use Jesus. No, you can't use Jesus. Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is the end. When you arrive at Christ, you have arrived at the end. That false gospel, it makes people callous. When you are giving to get, it makes you callous. You have to learn to give without conditions. And of course, when you are giving to get, you will never give enough to people who are not saying thank you to you. And that doctrine is a doctrine that makes believers live in unforgiveness. That doctrine of giving to get, that's what makes believers live in unforgiveness. Because they are not working in love. They are not working in the spirit. In everything they do, they must get something. It, that's the kind of version of gospel that makes people not to pray well. Every prayer they must pray must be getting something out of it. They can't come to prayer just to pray for the kingdom, no. And those are the churches where if you say, let us pray now for the gospel. Let us pray for evangelism. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But if you say, now, those who are enemies that are hindering your promotion, hey, Holy Ghost fire! Holy Ghost fire! When it is prayer for themselves, you will see the strength. 
Because they are living a self-centered life. A greedy life coming from the kind of gospel preached to them. We've got to come to a place of selflessness. And only the true gospel of Christ will produce people that are selfless. People that are giving. People that are sacrificial. And people that are kingdom minded. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. Stand on your feet. Let's, let's close. That's all I've got for you tonight. What a service tonight. Glory. Amen. Oh, I tell you, I'm excited. Are you excited tonight? Father, we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice, wherever they are listening around the world, on television, on radio, in all our house centers, campuses all over the world. Grace abound towards you. Revelation knowledge grows big on your inside. Jesus takes total possession of your being and we declare you walk in the spirit. You walk in generosity. You walk in willingness. You are a responsible believer. You are not covetous. You are not greedy therefore I decree that you are selfless you give to the kingdom the kingdom of God is very vital in your life your resources are serving the needs of saints and in the name of Jesus we decree that the gospel covers the whole of this planet covers the whole of Africa covers the rest of the world the true gospel of Christ in the name of Jesus barriers terminated obstacles taken off in the name of Jesus and we decree that the people of God are built up and your people of God occupy the places of relevance and are making a difference in a world that never knew Christ. Thank you for the blessing tonight. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Oh, glory to God, I tell you. What a blessing tonight. Oh, I tell you what a blessing. Amen and amen. Now get your offerings. Let's give quickly in honor. When you hear a teaching like this, immediately that's a good time to give. We give expecting nothing. We give in faith, we give with joy, and we give with excitement. Praise God. Our giving is in honor of Christ, what Christ has done, and in honor of the needs of the saints. I'd like you to grab an offering. If you're watching online, there are banking details for you to give. If you're watching on television, there are banking details. Radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush, in another one or two minutes, we'll read for you the banking details, and it's going to be exciting as we answer your calls, respond to your question, and, answer, and you know, respond to your queries by email in Ask the Council. But just before we do that, today is Dr. Rachel Damina's birthday. That's my wife. That's the, you know, my life partner, the woman of God. Dr. Gabriel, come wish mama a happy birthday. Give her a shout out on behalf of everyone that is a part of this ministry worldwide. And then after that, I will, I will, you know, we'll just speak a blessing over. We want to say a big happy birthday to our mama. We're so excited this morning, even at Kingdom Life Network, as we're just commencing, we just have to keep celebrating her for being such a blessing and making it possible for Papa to have the time and all the presence of mind and all the necessary requirements in this, in the environment in the house to be possible for him to abide and go with the mandate of God that God has placed upon his life. Mama, we say a big thank you. We celebrate you. You are such a blessing. You are such an example. And we we live ever to celebrate that we have a mother like you and we're so excited and proud of you all the time. Hallelujah. Happy birthday again, mama. All of us all over the world we say happy birthday and we celebrate you. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Oh my goodness, what a blessing. What a blessing my wife is to me, Dr. Rachel. My wife, I love you. Now, I don't know what is how to say it, but I love you and thank you for being the helpmate that you've been and the blessing that you've been to my life. Great grace is upon you. The Lord continue to increase you, keep you, preserve you. You are delivered from wicked and unreasonable men, preserved by the power of God. In the name of Jesus. You go from strength to strength, from grace to grace, and you continue to make impact on this world like never before. You lack nothing. You are sufficient in all things. In Jesus' name. Happy birthday once again. We love you. We love you. Amen. Oh my goodness, what a blessing tonight. Glory! Amen. All right, grab your offerings. Let's give in faith. Let's give with joy tonight. Lift it up. Father, we give in faith. We give with joy. Thank you for the privilege of honoring your word and honoring you. And we decree and declare that as we give tonight, our offerings are a sweet smell. And we thank you for the blessing that is upon this house. Thank you for everyone giving. Your needs are met supernaturally. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
and amen. Just before I sign off, those of you on radio in a quiet bomb, listen carefully. Tomorrow morning, we resume counseling. Every morning, 9 a.m., we're here to counsel. Those of you that have needs, you need to be counseled. You have questions, you have issues you want to talk to us about. 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, we'll be here to counsel with you. Every morning, 9 a.m., for, for, the, for the next one month. We're here every day. So wherever you are listening by way of radio or listening by television in Akwaibom or even in the neighboring states here, you want to travel down and come for counseling, we're here to help you. If you've been following on radio and you have things you want to ask, things you want to clarify, just come 9 a.m. every day, Monday to Saturday. We are here to counsel and pray for you and help you with sound Bible exegesis and those of you need prayer god answers our prayer always so you can be sure that if you come and we pray for you your prayer will be definitely answered he hears us all the time now let me also mention so from tomorrow 9 a.m we'll be waiting for you let me also mention that tomorrow all our house pastors and i'm sure they're listening to me right now all house pastors power city house pastors all of you and district pastors I'm meeting with all of you tomorrow at 6 p.m. I'm announcing it here because the notice went out yesterday so that nobody has an excuse. Tomorrow evening, 6 p.m., I'll be meeting with all house pastors and all district pastors and all welfare, the welfare team, all the welfare team members. I'm meeting with all of you tomorrow, 6 p.m. So any house center you belong, if your house pastor is acting like he's not hearing me, Tell him Papa says he's meeting with you people tomorrow by 6 p.m. <laughs> okay, praise God. You know, I like to joke all the time. So make sure you're here tomorrow. We're going to have a good time. 6 is 6. No late coming is allowed. Praise God. All right, guys, we love you. We look forward to seeing you in the other studio with Mr. Michael Bush. Where we'll be answering your calls and responding to your queries. And until I see you in the other studio, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Glory! Amen. We Woo, trust that you I'm have excited by this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com. Thank you for staying tuned. The bank details, especially for our radio audience. The account name is Power City International. There are three banks. FCMB is number one, Zenith number two, and UBA number three. So I start with UBA. 139-26465. 139-26465. That's UBA, Power City International. FCMB is the second at this point. 2982-6820-28. 2982-6820-28, Power City International Steel, and so too for 1012-36-5912. That's for Zenith, 1012-36-5912. For sponsorship, and we're in dire need of sponsorship, you know, and we'd like to thank those who continue to be sponsors, some very quiet, some, um, you know, continue to come in. We're looking forward to having as many more sponsors join us. So the number to call to sponsor the program, to support the program, uh, is plus two three four if again you are calling from outside the country otherwise it's 0803 275 6104 you wire an email or two to dr abel damina at yahoo.com doctor there is dr okay so my name is michael bush i'm your uncle could you please help me now welcome the man of the moment the set man the man 
Global Baba, Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. So good to see you again today. Global Baba, so nice to see you. Praise God. Okay, wow. so Global Baba, we just would open with a prayer. Yes. Yes. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice that the word of God is growing and increasing in the nations of the earth. Amen. The gospel is thriving more than ever before. Amen. Men are coming to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. And Father, we pray for Christians who are in countries where there's persecution. We ask that you preserve them, strengthen Amen. them, keep them. Amen. And we declare that through them, the gospel is forcefully going forth Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for Aquaibom State. We pray for our governor. We pray for his cabinet. We ask that all public and civil servants receive grace and enablement to continue to serve this community, creating an environment of peace for the gospel to continue to thrive. And Lord, we pray for other governments of nations. We decree that in every nation, the gospel of Christ continues to grow. Ministers of the gospel are raised. Believers are equipped. Disciples continue to multiply. We rejoice for answered prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Global Bible, we spent the night in uh, Italy. Yes. And uh, it was nice to see Love Screws. Even yes. though it was just in the spirit. Yes. I saw her all in the spirit. Wow. I'm looking forward to seeing her physically. Amen. Okay. So Global Bible, we're starting out from Italy where we spent last night says hello global baba and mr bush i want you to pray for me global baba because whenever i'm driving now fear would just come inside of me before i didn't used to have that fear when i drive but now it's bad i just started to notice it um, suddenly recently thank you global baba amen we'd love to pray for you but beyond prayer mm. you must start acknowledging acknowledge that god has not given to you the spirit, the spirit of fear, fear but of love of power and of a sound mind acknowledge that and consciously say those words to yourself i believe in the love that god has for me remember love perfect love cast out fear he that fear it is not made perfect in love and fear has torment so make up your mind not to be tormented by fear and tortured by fear by acknowledging the love that god has for you god loves you so much the enemy can do nothing about it you you are complete you are kept you are hid in christ amen and we speak boldness we amen. speak confidence amen and we rebuke every fear amen. and we silence the voice of the enemy amen in jesus name amen. amen so helen in italy that was for you there's still from italy global baba this one says hello global baba and mr bush i'm doing this anonymously from italy global baba, i just want to thank god for your life and that of your household can you please explain 1 Corinthians 11.24 for me? Because I want to really understand that verse well. 1 Corinthians 11.24. And when he had given thanks, he took it and said, Take it, this is my body. <laughs> what you are asking me for needs like seven hours of teaching to even finish explaining the dynamics without too much exegesis. So my advice, I have a book I just wrote on the communion table the communion table it covers that whole exegesis all of that whole you know subject matter i will encourage you to order for it and our office will make sure you get it wherever you are it will take care of that explanation bless you amen okay so global Baba staying on the last entry from italy comes from Ose, who says i'm a nigerian global Baba, but i live here i live here in italy Global Baba, thank you for being a great and positive enlightenment to the world. Number one, please, I want to understand what the Bible means by saying, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Well, again, you've got to read the pretext and the post-text to understand that he was not just talking about touch not my anointed generally, do my prophets no harm generally. It was a context. It was within a context. And people just keep quoting that verse of scripture all the time. It, there's nowhere else it's repeated in the Bible outside of that one place. And one verse of scripture does not form a doctrine. So it was a particular situation, an event that warranted the composition of those words in the Old Testament. So my advice, read five verses before, read five verses after. If you still don't understand, ask us again. We will, we will take the time to do the exegesis for you. Okay, so let's um, take the second question from us. It says, um, Global Baba. If you attend a church where the pastor misbehaves by lying and committing adultery, is it right to call and try to correct, to call him out and try to correct such a pastor? Thanks so much. I'm happy being with you always online. 
Well, you cannot call your pastor out because he is not answerable to you. You are just a member of the church. But your pastor is answerable to people over him. And those are the people that have the right to call him out. They have the right to rebuke him. They have the right to correct him. And they, they have the right to put him in check. You know, so you can call him out. The best you can do is pray for him. Pray for him. And if you have the privilege of discussing with him, you could in a very wise way tell him, you know, um, that you've observed a few things. You don't know if there's a lesson he wants you to learn or there's something you're not understanding. Maybe there's a depth of revelation within that particular manifestation that you've observed in him and you can recite what you saw and allow him to either explain or apologize or something. You must have a way of coming. The Bible says, entreat, entreat elders, entreat them as fathers. You entreat. You don't call them out. You entreat. The only person that can call your pastor out is the person he's submitting to. From Italy, we're heading to Belgium. Hello, Global Baba and the Intercontinental Michael Bush. Greetings to the legendary Mr. Michael Bush and the Global Baba. My name is Ode Jaffet. I write from Belgium. I'm a son and disciple of Global Baba Damina. I celebrate and honor you, Global Baba, for your labor of love in the world and doctrine. Thank you for teaching and molding us as able ministers of the New Testament. We are proud to be your sons and disciples. Greetings to Mama, the Damina girls, and the entire Power City family. Global Baba, please, I need clarity on these portions of scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, verse 15, we are told by Brother Luke that there were 120 brethren in the upper room after Jesus had ascended to heaven who were praying and waiting for the baptism of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. We read further in Chapter two, in, in chapter 2, verse 41 of the book of Acts, that 3,000 people believed, were saved, and added to the number of believers. Again, Global Baba, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 7, Brother Paul mentions the number, the names of a number of brethren who saw Jesus when he rose from the dead. He equally states that about 500 brethren saw Jesus after he resurrected at once. My question, Global Baba. Is this a contradiction from Luke's narrative in the, Bible, in the book of Acts and Brother Paul's account in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Please clarify on the different figures in these different accounts, considering the number of brethren who saw Christ upon his resurrection from the dead. Thank you, Global Baba, always for soundness in the word. We are delivered from all wicked and unreasonable men. Love you. Amen. It's not a contradiction. 120 in the day of Pentecost received the Holy Ghost. And on that day when Peter preached, 3,000 souls were added. And then, of course, Brother Paul was talking about 500 other people who saw Jesus when he rose. It's not in any way a contradiction, but an explanation of three different events that occurred after his resurrection. So it's not a contradiction. It's just explanation. 500 people saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And then on the day of Pentecost, 120 people were in Solomon's porch who spoke in tongues. And of course, 3,000 souls were added on that day of Pentecost after Peter preached the gospel. So it's not a contradiction. Okay, so Global Baba, I'm trying to see whether we can leave. Okay, I'm told. Okay, so it's exactly 10 minutes. The callers uh, can start ringing in now. Hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes. 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 I'm going to bring up the Baba Bless you. Bless you. Glory! That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm so excited now. I'm so excited right now. Okay. Yeah, um, because I'm a little I'm going to watch the idea. Um, I'm going to go fast. The phone that I listen to him, I will be found, be found in the first time. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I can't see too long my radio. But also, I'm listening to the answer and the question and the I'm too weak. I can't just sit back and listen to the message from, um, in the, the, uh, from the south to the last. Everything goes right. I know the questions I can, but it's going to be too much to I'm going to confess you have nothing to do with my life. It has been profound, it has been fantastic, to check up, and since the right I wasn't so glad to see you to pray for me. I mean, better than prayers. I've seen these prayers, ferocious prayers. I've been directing with them, 
a lot of our times are being invited with health challenges for the past few years in my life. From the eyes, the nose, the mouth, to my entire body. Um, so, let's pray. Uh, pray, brother, we can be present. I'm running this nation and uh, all the brothers and friends in my life. So, this person is like, I'm, I can talk about this later in my life and move okay. on. So, that's the one. I might say, I have a brother who questions a lot. But it was a time for a strength I was circumscribing to a bad, um, very sharp question. How can you say that the gospel is not necessarily, it's not, it's not exactly motivational messages? Now, we have a, uh, a barrage of motivational pictures all over the world, and I am going to listen to them as well. And even you, in your past, some years ago, you invited one of them, the late Dr. Malcolm Morel, to come and preach in the church. So, we have the symptoms of motivational pictures because in the other time, they were crushed by the entire detector. And so, uh, then my friend, and I just listened to some of them, and I got left at massively. Uh, that's number one. Okay, you know, you, you know, you know, I just want to hello, hello, I, I, I'm afraid I have to stop you. Uh, we can barely hear you. We just have two from you. Let's try and see whether I can handle that. And then we try and call again and see if the line will be clearer. Yes, global. Yeah. I think the first one was about prayer. That yeah, is prayer healed. for healing. Yes. And I think the second one is asking why we say motivational preaching yes. is not the gospel. Brother Paul says, when I came, I did not come with enticing words enticing words motivational speakers are enticers they are like marketers the gospel is not a marketing we are not marketing something we don't use enticing words that's why to an unbeliever the gospel is foolishness it can motivate an unbeliever it is foolishness once it becomes motivation it means a believer and unbeliever will enjoy it but the gospel of Christ is foolishness to a man that is not saved. It is only power to those that, of us that are saved. And the reason why Brother Paul says motivation is not the gospel, and it cuts across the entire, you know, fulcrum of the scriptures. Jesus never spoke anything that was motivating. That is why all of his life, Pharisees and Sadducees kept opposing him and fighting what he preached. The apostles, all of them, Peter preached in the book of Acts. They took them and gave them the beating of their life. That cannot be motivation. Motivation should be what even government will embrace. There is something about the cross that is an offense to an unbeliever. The preaching of the cross is an offense to a man that is perishing. So if you are motivating people, it is not the gospel. The gospel is the message of death, burial, and resurrection. There's a place for motivators, but don't call it the gospel. They have their place. They motivate people. But if it is the gospel of Christ, it does not entice. It does not include men's wisdom. And it has facts. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That is what we call the gospel of Christ. So it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday night. High mass. So why do they do this Good Friday stuff? In well, again, Easter is not a Bible concept. It's a, it's a concept of heathens. People who don't know God. But the world borrowed it to use it for dead burial and resurrection mm. and because it has become a universal holiday so we all take it as a time in power city is our time to rest mm. and maybe just preach christ and preach the dead burial and resurrection and also the good thing about it is that it gives opportunity to all churches yes. to talk about the death yeah. burial and resurrection including motivational speakers <laughs> that is one time everybody preaches the gospel global barber yeah. this caller hello Hello, sir. Yeah, thank you for joining us. You know where you're calling from. Thank you, sir. I'm Pastor Winston from Taraba. Yeah, okay. Pastor, fire on. All right. I want to thank uh, Nova Baba for uh, the word, the message that is blessed and transformed. Uh, my, question, my question is, I've listened to him for some years now. Particularly, I got to meet Nova Baba 2002 in Jaws. Then he was putting uh, the other gospel. I I liked him as a person, but then I never I never liked the message he preached. Mm. But uh, my question is: At what point did he realize 
this message that he is preaching now. And when he got the message, how did he convince Mama? And how did he communicate this message to the church? Because particularly uh, in Africa, or in our land today, I come to realize that our leaders find it difficult to, 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 to accept that they were wrong and they want to make amends. So at what point did he communicate this message to the church? And how did the church receive it? Well, the truth of the matter is, people ask me, I even had to write a book on it. The truth of the matter is, um, when I was preaching the other gospel, I preached it with all my heart because that's all I knew sincerely. So I was actually sincerely wrong. But I got to a point where I felt emptiness. I felt a void. I felt like, uh, is all that there is to God, prosperity, cars, money, breakthrough, success, is there no more? You know, it was too empty. It was too shallow. I was no more happy. I find no fulfillment. I felt really empty in my soul. And I, I started losing the joy of ministry. I was no more excited about preaching that gospel anymore. So I knew that something was missing. So what I did was I took time off the church and we traveled out of this church. We went away for about one month just to go and pray. And mama knew all my struggles because I, I live an open life with her. I told her how I felt and all that. And she also told me she was feeling the same void and emptiness that the messages were not touching anymore. She couldn't feel it. And she knew there was more to God than just money and houses and cars and breakthroughs and get it and succeed. And so we went together, spent time, prayed. And then in the midst of the prayer, I was seeking to know what was wrong. After one month, I never came at it. So I got to the bookshop and I saw Andrew Womack's books. I bought all his books. I don't like Andrew Womack because he's too cold in preaching for my liking. I like hot preachers. So, but I felt like everybody was listening to him. He must have something. So I bought his books. If I can't hear his message on TV, I can read his books. But I never read the books. We got back home. Long story short, I traveled again. And this time when we traveled, I didn't still read the books. I was still praying. But on my way back from that trip, I decided to read the books. I picked one of the books by Andrew Womack. And the first, first eight pages of that book sorted me out. As I read, I just saw where my missing link was. And then as I got back, I took off another time and went into in-depth studies. Now, when I did theology, I was a very good student of Christology. So the moment I saw that Christ was the message of the scriptures by revelation, it was easy for me to go back into my Christology and come up with the clear message of Christ. It didn't take me much. But then it didn't stop there. How did I transition the church? Because for Mama, it was, we, we transitioned together. She saw what I saw and got through and understood where we, we were. When I came back to our church, I made up my mind that I was ready to lose all our members. I was ready to start ministry afresh preaching the right gospel. So I got to our church and I did a 30 days conference. And in the 30 days of conference, I started preaching the truth of the gospel. And I apologized for all the things I thought that were not right. I apologized. And then I started teaching and I begged them to be patient with me. A lot of people left our church. Almost half of the church, or over half, left because they thought something was wrong with me. But I didn't mind because I made up my mind to start afresh. So I started preaching the truth of the gospel a few people stayed and some more people started coming and started coming and we kept growing and kept teaching and making correct corrections up until today. And it's just a joy to know that over the years we have successfully transitioned people into the truth of the gospel of Christ in our church and more and more people all over the world have been enriched by that decision to do what is right where God is concerned in spite of the pain that it brought. Now the pain is gone. I have joy now preaching that gospel. And I remain grateful to God for opening my eyes. Global Baba. The Intercontinental. How much I love you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Many thanks for joining us, ma'am. Your name, where you calling from? Okay. My, my name is Kotoa. I'm calling from New York. Fire on, ma'am. Yes, I am Kotoa calling from New York. Okay, go ahead. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you about Papa for the world well done. I've been following the program for a long while. I'm really blessed by his message. Then, going to my question, I have two questions to ask. The number one question is, I want to know the difference between positive thinking and faith. And then the second question is, 
the Bible says that every other sin a man committed shall be forgiven. Then whosoever sins against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. forgiven. So I want to know how to or how to want to against the Holy Spirit. Good. Okay. That is my question. Joshua. All right, thank you, Joshua, for calling. We appreciate it. First question, uh, what is the difference between positive thinking and faith? Positive thinking is humanistic. It's humanistic. It's not Christ. Positive thinking is just telling a man, think positive. Think I will make it. Think I will get there. Think uh, uh, I'm a bomb ready to explode. Think like that. Think positive. Now, that's not Bible. That's just what motivational speakers tell everybody to think and to do, to have a positive attitude to life. Faith is the revelation of Jesus. What Jesus has done for you on the cross, death, burial, resurrection. And today in you, what Christ is doing through you based on what he has done for you. That is faith. And that is the way believers are supposed to think. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or praise, think on these things. So you think within the confines of what Christ has done. Second question, what's the what is the meaning of sin against the Holy Ghost? Well, blasphemy or sin against the Holy Ghost is the rejection of the sacrifice of Jesus. If you reject the gospel, you reject the death of Christ, you reject what Christ has done for you, then there is no forgiveness for you because the basis for forgiveness is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hope that helps you. Fantastic. You should. Okay, Global Papa, let's just go back a little. Let's just take um, two, three steps um, backwards and go back to the last caller from Taraba. He had um, talked about the past and all of that. Yes. There is a frivolous, if you like, um, recurring question, a chronic question. People continue to ask that. There are even people who accuse you that, oh, you now have changed because you, you got all the money you wanted, built all the houses and all of that. How do you react to those people? Well, m no man ever has enough, enough. money including the billionaires. Nobody ever has enough money. So if I was in ministry for money, I would have never changed because I never had enough money not to need more money. Even now, I need more money. Mm. And I will always need, need more money. But money is not what brought me to, be, to the ministry, honestly, because when I started preaching the gospel close to 40 years ago now, when I started preaching the gospel, pastors were not rich. It was a time where if you're a pastor... It is difficult for somebody to give you his daughter to marry. That's when I started preaching the gospel. So my motivation was not money. My motivation was a raw passion to see people born again. Now, when people say I gathered money, how much money can a man really gather? It's true that people gave money when I was preaching that gospel. But most of the money came into the church. And don't forget, don't forget that back then we already had Kingdom Life Network. Kingdom Life Network today is 17 years and counting. And when Kingdom Life Network was on back then, it was costing us several millions every month to keep Kingdom Life Network on. Several millions. And there were other projects going on in the church. So even though the monies were coming, the monies were still serving the ministry. And the records are there. We have an account session. We have even a chartered accountant who is running our account. So it's not like I was having the money for my pocket. It was still coming for the ministry. And when I apologized to the church and told them I'm sorry for all the things I taught on prosperity, I also told them if anybody thinks he's not happy, he wants to get his money back, he's free to come and talk to me about it. I apologize, honestly. But you see, the good thing is this. Why people think I had money and I still have plenty of money is because they seem to see that it's like nothing has really changed where my projects and programs are concerned. And the truth is this. If when I was preaching the gospel of prosperity, I had money to do things. How much more now that I'm preaching the gospel of Christ, the message of salvation and redemption? People that have been affected by the truth of the gospel have discovered that they have a responsibility to the gospel and their generosity has come alive. And people are giving not to get, but giving because they are in love with what Christ has done and the assignment he has given to the church. So okay. that's my response to that. Fantastic to response. That, yeah. Fantastic response. Fantastic response, Lobo Baba. Fantastic response. And Pastor Emmanuel, I apologize to you. I need to carry this to tomorrow. So Global Baba will spend the night again in um, 
South Africa, I don't know. I, I think we've spent too much, um, too many nights in South Africa. Perhaps we should just do a shock one to Zambia. How can I know I'm born again, Global Baba? I don't know myself if I'm born again. May you help me be born again? Uh, somebody writing from Zambia. Well, we may need to call you at the Zambia press. We may need to connect you with Pastor K in Zambia, Lusaka. He will look for you. Pastor K will look for you and share the message with you because it's not just prayer that gets you born mm, again. Sure. It's the message. Somebody needs to teach you that message to a point where you believe it and know it. You will know it when you're born again. So Amen. we will get in touch with you. Sure. Bless you. Global Bible, we need to go. Um, we, so the, the, the program continues tonight? Yeah, the program continues tonight on, uh, on Inspiration, Inspiration 9 to 10, yeah. Heritage 10 to 12, tomorrow morning, 5.45 a.m. XLFM, 11 to 1 p.m. Radio Aquaibum, 1 to 3, XLFM, 3 to 5, you know your FM. And we're back here again tomorrow evening on Comfort FM 6 p.m. And great grace to every one of you. Praise. Okay. No more, but just before we go, I don't know, we have 30 seconds for prayers. Yes. Just for all the Father, we pray for people in need of a miracle tonight. Amen. People in need of healing. Amen. We declare your body is healed. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We rebuke every symptom. We rebuke corona. We come against every attack of the enemy on your lungs. We come against every attack of the enemy on your brain cells. Amen. Satan, get your hands off. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And we declare healing for your body. Amen. And Father, we pray for those in need of a miracle. Receive a miracle Amen. in other areas of your lives. Amen. Thank you, Father, for answer prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our production team and the rest of the team here in Uyo, Nigeria, this is Michael Bush. God bless you. Goodbye from here. Yeah. Amen. And be blessed.